Classic Horror Stories, The Spectre Bride by William Harrison Ainsworth. A cult of Hain and Wolf, a close of the year 1655, with his result of fashion and gaiety, a baron of that name was the most powerful nobleman in Germany, equally celebrated for patriotic achievements of his sons and the beauty of his only daughter. The state of Hain Wolf, which was situated in the centre of the Black Forest, Forgiven to one of his ancestors by gratitude of the, na- of the nation, ascended with other hereditary possessions to the family of the present owner. It was castellated, Gothic mansion built according to the fashion of the times, a grandish style of architecture, and consisted principally of the dark, winding corridors and vaulted tapestry rooms, magnificent indeed in their size, but ill suited to private comfort. From their very circumstance, their dreary magnitude, a dry grove of pine and mountain ash encompassed the castle on each side, through an aspect of gloom round the scene which was seldom enlivened by the cheering sunshine of heaven. The castle bells rang out a merry peal at the approach of the winter twilight. The warder was stationed with his retune to the battlements to announce the arrival of the company who was invited to share the amusements that reigned within the walls. A lady, Cotatina, the baron's only daughter, had just attained her seventeenth year. A brilliant assembly was invited to celebrate the birthday. Large vaulted apartments were thrown open for reception of numerous guests and gaieties in the evening that scarcely commenced when the clock from the dungeon tower was heard to strike the unusual solemnity, an instant a tall stranger arrayed in a dark suit of black made his appearance in the ballroom. He bowed courteously on every side, but he was received by all with the strictest reserve. No one knew who he was or whence he came, but his evident from his appearance, he was a nobleman of the first rank. And though a free introduction was accepted with distrust, he treated by all with respect. He addressed himself particularly to the daughter of the Baron, and so tender in his remarks, so lively in his studies, and so fascinating in his dress, he quickly interested the feelings of his, of his young and sensitive altar. In fine, another, after some hesitation on the part of the host, who, with the rest of the company, was unable to approach the stranger with difference, he was requested to remain a few days at the castle, invitation which was cheerfully accepted. The dead and the night drew on, and when all had retired to rest, a dull, heavy bell was heard swinging to and fro in the grey tower. Though there was scarcely a breath to move the forest trees, many guess when they met the next morning at the breakfast table, they had feared they heard there had been sounds of the most heavenly music which, while all persisted in affirming, they had heard awful noises proceeding, as it seemed, from an apartment for which a stranger at the time were occupied. He soon ever made his appearance, breakfast circle, and when the circumstances of the preceding night was allude, were alluded to a dark smile of unnatural meaning played around his satirian features, then relaxed into a expression of deepest melancholy. Address his conversation principally to Cotolinia. He talked of the different climes he had visited, of the sunny regions of Italy, where the very air breathes the fragrance of flowers, summer breeze sighs over the land of sweets. He spoke of her and his delicious countries, where the smile of the day sinks into soft and beauty in the night. The loneliness of the heaven is never for an instant obscured. He strewed tears of wreck from the bosom of his fair auditor, and for the first time she regretted that she was yet at home. Days rolled on, and every moment increased the fervour of the fresh, inexpressible sentiments which the stranger inspired her. He never disclosed of love, but he looked it in his own language, in his manner, in his insinuating tone of his voice, in a slumbering softness of his smile. He found that he succeeded in spying her with fable sentiments, a sneer, and the most dull of all meaning spoke for an instance and died again, dark features countenance. 
Then he met her in the company of his parents. But he, but he was at once respectful and submissive. He only went alone with her in a rambling through the dark recesses. For us, he assumed the guise of the most impassioned Amara. As he sat sitting one afternoon, the Baron to Wilson Cottage apartment library, the conversation happened to turn upon supernatural agency. Strange remains of reserved and mysterious during this discussion. But when the Baron in a jocular manner denied the essence existence of spirits and so satirically mocked their appearance, his eyes glowed, an earthly lustre, his form seemed to dilate to more than its natural dimensions. When the conversation was ceased, a powerful pause, fearful pause, a few seconds of chorus of celestial harmony was heard, peering for the dark forest glade. All were, were entered with delight, the stranger was disturbed and gloomy. He looked at his noblest host with compassion, and Hammer, and something like a tear swam in his dark eye. A lapse of a few seconds, the music died gently in the distance, and all hushed as before. Baron soon after quitted the apartment, and followed almost immediately by the stranger. He had not long been absent. The awful noise of hearse and agonies of death was heard. The Baron was discovered stretched dead along the corridors. His countenance was convulsed with pain. The grip of a human hand was visible, his blackened throat. The alarm was instantly given, the castle searched in every direction. The stranger was seen no more. The body of the Baron, in the meantime, was quietly committed to the earth. There was a remembrance of the dreadful transition recalled, but not, a, not as a thing that once was. After the departure of the stranger, who had been f- indeed fascinated, in her very senses, the spirits of the gentle Cordelia evidently declined. She loved to walk early and late in the walks the, that he for once for granted who called his last words to dwell on his sweet smile and wonder the spot where he had once discoursed with her own love. He had not avoided all society, never seemed to be happy. But when left alone in the solitude of the chamber, it was then she gave vent to her affection and tears and love and pride of maiden modestly concealed in public, burst forth in the hours of privacy. So beautiful, so yet so resigned, was a fair man, uh, was fair mourner. He seemed already an angel, freed from the turmoils of the world, and prepared to take flight to heaven. As she was one summer evening, in rambling to a sequestered spot, had been selected for a safe residence. A slow step advanced towards her. He turned around and to an infinite surprise, discovered a stranger. He stepped gaily to her side and commenced an animated conversation. You left me, exclaimed the divided girl. I thought all happiness was fled from me forever. We return, and shall we not again be happy? Happy, replied the stranger, scorn but burst of derision. Can I ever be happy again? Can there? But excuse the agitation, my love, and impute to the pleasure I experience at our meeting. Oh, I have many things to tell you, and I and many kind words to receive. It is not so, good sweet one. Come tell me truly. <coughs> have you been happy in my absence? Now I see in the sulken eye and the plat- that pallid cheek. The poor wanderer was at least gained some slight interest in the heart of his beloved. I've roamed to many other climes, seen other nations, I've met other females, beautiful and com- accomplished, but I have met with but one angel. She is here before me. Accept this simple offering. My affection, dearest, continued the stranger, plucking a heath row from its stem, beautiful in the wild, flowers that deck thy hair, as sweet as its love, I bear thee. It is sweet indeed, replied Cordelia, but its sweetness must wither, here another night closes being already beautiful but its beauty is, is short lived as love in twice by men as that's not them by the type of our atta- attachment being the delicate evergreen and sweet flower the blossoms throughout the, the, the year she say as a weave in into my hair violets have bloomed and died roses have flourished and decayed but evergreen is still young and so is the love of, of heart you will not you cannot desert me. I live but in you. 
You are my hopes, my faults, my existence itself. I lose you, lose all my all. I was but a solitary wild flower in a wilderness of nature till you just transplanted me to more gentle soil. Can you break, now break the fond heart you first taught to glow? The passion speak not thus, returned the stranger. It rends my very soul to hear you. Leave me, forget me, avoid me forever. For your eternal ruin must ensue. I'm a thing abandoned of God and men. And did you not see the scared heart and scarcely beats in this manly mass of deformity? You would flee me as you would in an adder in your path. Here is my heart. Love, feel how cold it is. There is no pause that betrays its emotion. For all is chilled and dead as the friends I once knew. Your unhappy love and your and you, you your poor Cordelia, shall stay to secure you. Think not I cannot can abandon you and your, your misfortunes. Now I will wander with thee through the wide world, be thy servant, thy slave, thou wilt have it so. I will shield thee from the night winds. I blow but not too roughly on an unexpected unprotected head. I will defend thee with the tempest that howls around through the cold world may devote thy name to scorn. Her friends may fall off and associates with live in a grave. As she be one fond heart, shall love the better in thy misfortune, and cherish thee that bless thee till still. She ceased and her blue eyes swam in tears, as she turned it to glistening affection towards the stranger. He averted his head from her gaze, and scoffed in a sneer of darkness, Darkest manners passed over his fine countenance. In his expression subsided. His fixed glassy eye resumed its unearthly chillness. He turned once again to his companion. Is the hour of sunset? He exclaimed. The soft, the beauteous flower, when the hearts of flower, lovers are happy in nature, smiles in unison with their feelings, but not to me. He smiled no longer. I, the ear, the morrow dawns. I shall very far in the house of my beloved. From the scenes where my heart is enshrined, as in Sipitu, I must leave thee, dearest, thou of the wilderness, to be sport of the whirlwind, a prey of the mountain billars. No, we shall not part, replied the impassioned girl. Where thou goest, when I go, thy home shall be my home, and God shall be my God. Swear it, swear it, resumed the stranger, wildly grasping her by her hand. Swear to the oath, fearful oath I should dictate. He then desired her to kneel, and holding his right hand, menacing attitude towards heaven, and throwing back his dark raven locks, exclaimed in a strain of bitter interpretation, the gursy smile, incarnate fiend. May the curse of offended God, he cried, hotly cling to the free, he forever in the tempest of the calm, a day and a night with sickness and sorrow and love. Life and death should have I serve from promise. The promise thou haste here may be mine. May the dark spirits be the dark down hole. How in thy ears, cursed chorus of fiends. May the, the air rack their bosom with quenchless flames of hell. May his soul be the laser. These are our house of corruption. The ghost of parted pleasure sits enshrined as a grave is in the grave. The hundred headed worm never dies when the fire is never extinguished. A spirit evil lord it over thy brow and proclaim thy passeth by. This is abandonment of God and men. A fearful spectre's halt thee in the night season. May thy dearest friends drop day, day by night and day in the grave. Curse thee with a dying breath. May all of it is, that is most horrible in human natures, but more sol- solemn than language can frame or lips can utter. May this and more than less be an eternal portion. Shouldest they violate the oath that thou hast taken, he ceased, hardly knowing what he, she did. The terrified girl ascended to the awful adjudication agi- and promised eternal infertility to him. Who is henceforth to be her lord? Be it said to them, I thank thee for thy insistence, shouted the stranger. 
I woo my fame pray bravely. She's mine, mine forever. I body and soul, both mine, mine in life and mine in death. What is tears, my sweet one? And yet the honeymoon is past. Why indeed thou hast cause for weeping? But when next we meet, we shall meet to sign a nuptial bond. We then imprinted a cold salute to the cheek of his young bride. He suffered and softening down the unattable horrors countenance requested her to meet him at eight o'clock on the ensuing evening on the chapel journeying to the castle home of Hersworth. She turned around to him with a burning sigh, as if to applaud protection from himself. The stranger was gone. On entering the castle reserved to be oppressed with deepest melancholy, relations vainly endeavoured to ascertain the cause of uneasiness. The tremendous oath she had sworn completely paralyzed her facilities, his fear for betraying itself. But even Stoyer's intonation of a voice, or the least variable expression of a countenance, the evening was concluded, found retreated, turned at rest, the Cortelia was unable to take repose from restlessness of the disposition. Requested to remain alone in the li- library that joined her apartment. All was now deep. Midnight. Every domestic had long since to retire to rest. A sound that could be distinguished was a sudden howl. How the baying dog, as he bayed a waning moon, Cordelia made in the library an altitude of deep meditation. A lamp was burnt on the table. The lamp was burnt on the table where she sat was dying away. The lower end of the apartment was already more than half obscured. The clock from the northern angle of the castle toiled. At the t- hour twelve, and sound echoed dismally, dismally in the solemn stillness of the night. Sudden, the open door at the farther end of the room was gently lifted. On its hatch, its latch, bloodless figure appareled the hediments of the grave, advanced slowly up the apartment. The sound hurried its approach. It moved with noiseless steps to the table where the lady was stationed. She did not at first perceive it. Till she felt a deaf, cold hand, fast grasping in her own, and heard a solemn voice whisper in her ear, Cortelia. She looked up, a dark figure was standing beside her. She endeavoured to scream, but the voice was unequal to its assertion. Her eye was fixed, as if by magic, a form which slowly removed the garb, concealed its countenance, closed the livid eyes, and skeletal shape of her father, seemed to gaze out with pity and regret and mournful explanation. Cotelia addresses the servants already. The church bell is told. A priest is at the altar, but they are aware it's an effect of fancied bride. There is room for her at the grave, and tomorrow shall she shall be with me. Tomorrow, faltered out the distracted girl, the spirits of hell shall be have registered it. Tomorrow must be a bomb must, must the bomb be cancelled, the figure ceased. So I retired, but was soon lost in security at distance. The morning evening arrived, and already, as the whole clock struck eight, Cotelia was on the road to the chapel. It was a dark, gloomy night. Thick masses of dud clouds sailed across the firmament. A roar of winter echoed awfully through the forest trees. She reached the appointed place. A figure was waiting for her. He advanced and discovered the features of the stranger. Why, this is well, my bride, he exclaimed with a sneer. Well, 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 will I repay the fondness for follow me. He proceeded to give her his sights through the winding avenues of the chapel until they reached the adjoining cemetery. Here they paused for an instant. A stranger in a softened tone said, But one more, one hour more. The struggle will be over, yet this heart of the Cardinal Manus can feel when it devotes so young, so pure a spirit to the grave. But it must, it must be, it proceeded, as the memory of her past love rushed on to her mind. The fiend whom I obey has so willed it. Poor girl, I am leading thee indeed to your nuptial, our nuptials, but a priest will be deaf. Uh, thy parents, the mouldering skeletons, what the heaps around. The witnesses of our, to our union, the lazy worms that revel on the carnage bones of the dead.
Come, my young bride, the priest is impatient for his victim. The receding, a dim blue light moved swiftly before him. Blade at the extremity of the churchyard, borders of the vault is open. They entered it in silence. The hallowed wind came rushing through the gloomy abode of the dead. At every side were piled the mouldering remnants of coffins, which were piece by piece upon the damp mud. Every step they took was on a dead body. Bleached bones rattled horribly beneath their feet. Instead of the vault rose a heap of unburied skeletons, whereupon the seat of the figure, too awful, even the darkest imagination to conceive. They approached it, the hollow vault rang with a hellish peal of laughter. Every mouldering court seemed endured with her unholy life. A stranger paused as he grasped the victim in his hand. One sigh burst from his heart. One tear glistened in his eye. He had but for an instant the figure frowned awfully at his ventilation and waved his gaunt hand. The stranger advanced. He made a certain mystic circles in the air, uttered unearthly words, and paused in excess of terror. And sudden, he raised his voice and wildly exclaimed, Spouse of the spirit of darkness, few moments of that thine, and thou must know to whom thou hast consigned in myself. I am an undying spirit of wretched who cursed his Saviour on the cross. He looked at me in closing hour of existence, and look, have not yet pass away, for I am cursed upon all on earth, I am eternally contemned to hell, I must cater for my master's taste, so the world is parched as it is in scroll, and heavens and earth passed away, I am he of whom thou mayest have read, in the feats thou mayest have heard, many souls have my master condemned me to a sair, and when my presence is accomplished, I may know the prose of the grave. I ought to have found its soul. I have the damned. I saw thee in thy hour of purity, and marked thee at once for my home. Thy father did I murder for his eternity. I permitted thee, warned thee of thy fate. I self have I beguiled for thy sympathy. How the spell has worked bravely. Thou shalt soon see my sweet one, to whom thou hast linked thine and thine fortunes for long seasons to move on the course of nature as long as lightning shall flash and thunders roll thy penance shall be eternal look below and see to what thou art destined she looked and vault split to thousand different directions the earth yawned asunder a row of mighty waters were heard was heard a living ocean of molten fire glowed in an abyss beneath her and blending from sh- with the shrieks of the damned, the triumphant shouts of the fiends rendered horror upon more horrible than imagination. Ten millions of souls were writhing, writhing in flaming flames, as burning billions, billions dashed among them against the broken rocks of that ab- ab- abandonment. They cursed their blasphemies of desire. Despair, and each curse echoed in thunder across the way. The stranger rushed towards his victim. For instance, he held her over the burning vista, looked fondly in her face, and wept as he was a child. This was but the impulse of that moment. Again, he grasped her hat in his arms, dashed her from, her, from him with fury, and uh, her last passing glance was cast in kindness on his face. So he allowed, but not mine is the crime, but the religion that I profess this, as for it is said, uh, here there is the fire, eternal eternity prepared for the souls of the wicked. Has not thy occurred its torments? She, she poor girl, had not deemed, not the stouts of the blasphemer, the delicate form bounded from rock to rock, ever bellow, and over form as she fell. The ocean lashed itself, as it were in triumph, receive her soul. She sank deep in a burning pit, ten thousand voices, Reverberated from the bottomless pit is this very evil. Here indeed is eternity torments prepared for thee, for there here the worm never dies, the fire never quenched.